Our speaker this evening is Tommy Tidwell, who comes to us from the South Cobb congregation. Tommy is, is well known here at uh, Bremen and has been with us on several occasions. Uh, Tommy's uh, and Larissa, his wife is here with him. Uh, I first met back in 1989, 90, something like that, when we worked together at the Clarkdale congregation. And I have grown to uh, love and appreciate Tommy uh, more and more. Uh, over the years, and especially for his work in the uh, South Cobb Church and along with me at Camp Anigahee, where we served together. Tommy got thrown a curveball this year, and uh, his week of camp was moved up three weeks, so he's been busy trying to prepare that, and uh, along with that, trying to prepare for the introduction to the book of Revelation that he's going to, oh, it's Hebrews, that's right, sorry, Tommy, uh, that he's going to present to us this evening. Uh, but uh, Tommy can handle it. He's, I'm sure, will be ready for camp at least by 2.30 next Sunday, and we're thankful to have him here while he's still fresh before camp. I think he came after camp last year. We'll bring Tommy up, speak to us, and we're looking forward to the introduction to our summer series and to the book of Hebrews. Good evening. I want you to step for just a moment kind of as an introduction to this class, and to think about, just for yourself, and if you would, raise your hands. Do any of you know of any unfaithful members of the church? If you do, raise your hand. I dare say that probably most of you do. And as you think about that for just a few moments, you can't help but realize that one of the greatest concerns that elders have and preachers have is for all the unfaithful members of the Lord's church. We sometimes try to sit around and talk about what has caused them to leave. We struggle with the ideal of why they left. We understand that there's a lot of reasons that go on behind the scenes that we're not aware of. We also know in no uncertain terms that if you start thinking about it and meditating on it, that if we could get back just all the unfaithful members of the Lord's church just say in the Atlanta area, all of our buildings would have to be renovated to take all the overflow that would have to happen every Sunday and every Wednesday. See, we have to realize that there's a real problem. We have to realize that there is a real need. And again, we have to ask the question, why is it that so many of these leave the church? Why is it that so many of them decide for whatever reason that they need to go back into the world? Could it be because of a lack of faith? I believe that's the case with many. Could it be because of personality conflicts with others in the congregation? Absolutely. Could it also possibly be because of matters of opinion, misunderstood as matters of faith, or vice versa? Absolutely. Could it possibly be as well that there's a lot of immaturity in the Lord's church? There is. I wish I could sit there and tell you that we wouldn't have any of these problems, and yet I submit unto you today that we do in no uncertain terms, and that's the reason why I appreciate the fact that you are studying the book of Hebrews. Because the book of Hebrews, when you get down to it, is trying to encourage Christians to stay faithful to the Lord in light of all of the things that we've just talked about. Tonight I have the big job of trying to give you an overview of the entire book. And again, a lot of times when I get into some passages of Scripture, I get so bogged down that it's wonder that I could get through one verse of Scripture. But somehow or another, I've got to try to cover all 13 chapters tonight and also try to give you just an overview of what's going on. But I wanted to start off with that idea because I submit unto you, as I said, that if we really grasp what he's saying in the book of Hebrews then this will help us to stay faithful. And it might also give us some encouragement to go back and talk to our brothers and sisters that's outside of Christ that at one time were faithful, but now have gone back to the world or have gone back to so many of these other places that they're going back to. And that's why I challenge you and encourage you to go through this study, to enjoy going through this study, to learn that could help you to be faithful and to learn what we could do to bring so many of these people back. The book of Hebrews was written to Palestinian Jews who were still living around Jerusalem. 
The book of Hebrews itself is called Hebrews because this was the title attached to the book and most of the manuscripts. And many of the secular references to the book does refer to it simply as to the Hebrews. The church at Jerusalem at one time was known as the church of the Hebrews. They're suggesting the idea that it was made up of all those Jews there at <clears throat> Jerusalem at that particular time. As you read through the book, you see so many ideas. Number one, you see that everybody in the book is very familiar with the Old Testament law. And in fact, with the possible exception of the book of Matthew, the book of Hebrews quotes more of the Old Testament than any other New Testament book. And again, I've often thought about the fact that I've heard even some of my brethren in the church say, well, we don't need to study the Old Testament because we're living under the New Testament today. Brethren, you cannot understand the book of Hebrews unless you have a good grasp of what's going on in the Old Testament. Because all through this book, he quotes passage after passage after passage after passage to prove his point and to bring out the idea of what they need to be doing, not only because he's saying it, but because this is something that Moses under the Old Testament law had said as well. There is no allusion in this book to the Jewish-Gentile controversies that you read about in Romans and in Galatians and in all these other books in the New Testament. Again, chapter 9, 10, and 13 emphasizes the idea is the writer is writing as if Jerusalem is there, and it is at that moment in time. And again, there was a very real danger that some of the Jews would go back to Judaism in light of the tensions with Rome. Well, let's talk say, just a second about what's going on there. Rome had, in essence, taken over Palestine earlier in 63 B.C., we understand as you go on and you read through the history there, we remember that there was a period of time where the Jews had some limited freedom. Even Herod the Great, the guy that they absolutely hated, that killed the babies in Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 2, had allowed the Jews to have some sort of freedom, and you didn't actually have a Roman procurator or a Roman governor in there at that time. What began to happen, though, as time went on, as Herod dies... All of his sons are about as worthless as he was. And so after a period of time, Augustus then starts appointing uh, counselors and he starts appointing different Roman guys to come in there and start taking over. And again, what's beginning to happen, especially by the time of 63 to 64, around in that area, Nero, and we all remember about Nero, he is going to commit suicide, but he's also demanding money all the money in the world that he could possibly get so that he could help rebuild Rome, the same city, if you remember, that he charged the Christians with burning. And one of the things that he did that got the Jews very angry, and again, as more and more of the Roman intervention comes in here, you see them getting angrier and angrier about it, but one of the things he required was that he take the money that was given to the church or to the temple treasury to start paying back all of those things and all the building projects that he had planned for Rome. Now, let me ask you this while I'm thinking about it for just a moment. How many of us love to pay taxes? Come on, get your hand. Oh, there's one guy back there that does so. I'll talk with you about this a little bit later on. I, I want to see your motive behind this, okay? But, but the bottom line is all of us have that attitude. I don't want to have anything to do with paying taxes. And especially when that money is going from local projects to some place in Rome, wherever I, I'm not even going to go there. And as this just continues to escalate, what begins to happen is finally about the year 66 A.D., the Jews just absolutely revolt, and that begins the Jewish wars. You can read about it in detail in the book of Josephus, the wars of the Jews. But what's beginning to happen, and think about if you were a Jew living there, a Jewish Christian at that time in the city of Jerusalem, you have all of the Jews wanting you because of that nationalistic fervor because of that, that attitude that we're going to win. They want you to come back and be a full-fledged Jew. Don't be a Jewish Christian. Don't go back there to that Christianity anymore. You, you be a Jew. You come back. And the pressure was there for them and everywhere in the world to, to come back and, and to do that. And again, the main reason why the writer is writing the book is to encourage those Jewish Christians to stay faithful to the Lord. Again, that's the reason why we need 
to study it as well. If the things that he was trying to emphasize to them, emphasize to us today, then hopefully it would help us to stay faithful. There's a great, also a great controversy as to who wrote the book. And depending on how long you've been in the church, you've probably been there long enough to know that, that the majority of the members of the church do believe that Paul wrote the book. But it's not like any other book Paul wrote. He doesn't identify himself in the first couple of verses. He just starts off saying, God. Okay, and it starts off, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And again, the ideal of a lot of people are that Paul didn't sign it the way he usually did because if he actually had written a letter to the Jewish Christians there in Jerusalem, they wouldn't have read it because they didn't like him anyway. They thought he was one that was going to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and they didn't like that either. So a lot of people have the attitude that they're not sure that Paul wrote it. A fellow by the name of Origen in the 2nd century emphasized the idea, and he says this, Who wrote the book for sure? God only knows. And you know, brethren, here's one of those matters of opinion that you can get upset about and leave about, or you can stay faithful to the Lord. We don't know for sure who did write it. I personally, and I'll stress this, in my opinion that, that I don't know necessarily that Paul wrote it, but somebody that was around Paul a lot did write it. In Hebrews, the second chapter, it seems like that he's talking about the second generation of Christians when he emphasized the idea in verses 3 and 4. He says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? And that sounds like a second-generation Christian. But again, I'm not going to say that for a fact. And please, well, let me just go ahead and emphasize, you've still got to love me if you disagree with me anyway. Well, Tommy, how do you know? The Bible tells you so, that's why. Okay, so that pretty well ends that discussion right there. It was read probably about the year 60 to 68. Some narrow the book down to 60 to 63. And again, it was written before the destruction of the city, and it was needed to encourage the Christians to stay faithful. If Jerusalem had been destroyed at this time, no doubt the Hebrew writer would have made the point that with the destruction of Jerusalem, in essence, God took away the whole Judaistic system, the whole Mosaic system. And so while many of the arguments that he makes right here is, would, would have not even necessarily been had to make, the church had to have been there around there long enough to see some fall into apostasy. In the 6th chapter, verses 4 through 6, and in the 10th chapter, he talks about those that have already strayed. But again, the idea that he does, as we're going to see, is emphasizing that they don't need to go back. And how does he do that? How can we encourage our brothers and sisters to stay faithful to Christ today? Well, I think we need to do something that Paul does so many, many times. And he does it not only in the book of Hebrews, if he wrote the book of Hebrews, but he does it in so many of these other, uh, other, other epistles. And that ideal is this. You always encourage people to keep their focus and their faith in Jesus Christ. I believe today the reason why so many members leave the church is because we get our focus off of Jesus. We forget who it's all about. We get to think it's all about me and it's all about what I want. Why are there so many uh, of the problems in the church today with regards to worship and everything? Because it's what we want. We're not sitting around really studying and coming to grips with what God wants anymore. We're not concerned about what God wants. We say, well, I, I like this because it, I, it makes me feel good, or I like this because it makes me do this. And, 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 and we go through all of this, and it all becomes about us, not about Him. In this book, as we're going to see in just a moment, he's going to stress the superiority of Jesus Christ over and over and over again. And I challenge you that as you go through this book, as you see this word better being used, because it is the key word of the book, he's stressing Jesus' superiority in all things. Number one, he stresses Jesus' superiority over the prophets. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. So you see he's emphasized in times past. And again, you can read those Old Testament prophets. You can see what they said. You can see how he tried to get across the message to the Jews of that day, how they needed to live the lives that they needed to live. But he says, God did this in times past, but now he's done what? He has spoken to us through the Son. Not a servant, but through the Son. 
And notice the things he says about the Son in verses 2 and 3. Whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom we also made the world, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels. The thing that he makes beginning in verse 2 is he said, God has spoken through his Son, and then he starts talking about the glory of Jesus Christ. Think about the reason why you became a Christian to begin with. I think most of us would sit down and realize we became to the realization that we were sinners, that we needed God's grace. And then somebody told us that beautiful story about how Jesus gave up the qualities of, of Godhood, as it was in Philippians chapter 2, became a man like you and I, died, lived the perfect life, kept the old law perfectly so that he might fulfill that law and then died upon the cross, not for any sin that he had committed, but for your sins and for my sins. Sometimes I think we need to be reminded of those simple truths. Tommy, I've heard it all my life. Well, good. I hope you hear it until the day you die. Because any time we get away from Jesus, we're going to lose the whole thing. He spoke over the prophets. He was over the prophets, but he's not only that. Here he emphasizes the idea that the Son is qualified. He is the Creator. He upholds all things by the word of His power. He is the Sustainer. And He also is our Redeemer. You see, I could spend an hour just on those two verses right there. But you see the point. We've got to go on. He emphasizes the superiority of Christ over the prophets. He emphasizes the superiority of Christ over the angels. In chapter 1, verse 4, through the second chapter at verse 18. The angels had given the Old Testament law through Moses. And he reemphasized the idea, again, bringing out that idea that the angels gave that law through Moses. So we understand that if Christ is over the angels, what necessarily has to happen? Then his covenant, and he's going to talk about that in a few moments, his covenant is superior to Moses' covenant. And they needed to understand and grasp that point. He who emphasizes the idea, and again, this was something for them hard to struggle with in chapter 3, verses 1 through 14, that Jesus has superiority over Moses. And in this beautiful passage of Scripture, in chapter 3, verses, chapter 3, verse 1 through the fourth chapter, verse 14, he stresses the idea that Jesus is the Son, Moses is the servant. And he makes a very big point that Jesus is the Son over his house, a house he built. See, Jesus built the house. He's the son over the house. But Moses was just what? He was just a servant in the house. And he emphasizes that idea that Jesus is superior to Moses as a result of that. He goes on and then begins to talk about the superiority of Christ's priesthood. Again, brethren, because we haven't studied the Hebrews like we should, because we haven't studied the Old Testament like we should, I think sometimes we miss so much there. Can we really start thinking about the priesthood of Christ and what he did? Think about that Old Testament law for just a few moments. The high priest would be allowed to go into the presence of God one time a year on the day of atonement, Leviticus chapter 16. That priest had to be the oldest son, uh, the oldest descendant of Aaron. He was allowed to go in there that one time, and that's the only time out of the entire year that the priest was allowed to go in there and actually have and buy or play with the blood, as it was, the blood of bulls and goats, which Hebrews 10 verse 4 could never take away sins. He was to then bring atonement to the people. Now look at the high priest that we have in Jesus Christ. And again, if we had the chance, we could go into this in so much detail. That fact that under the Old Testament priest, they themselves went in there and they had to sacrifice for their own sins. They had to pay the atonement for their own sins. Jesus didn't have to pay for his sins. He was the perfect priest in that respect. The high priest had to go in there and work for somebody else. Jesus, again, was doing the same thing as the mediator for us. 1 Timothy 2 at verse 5, he's the mediator between God and man. And as you look at that and as you think about that, you continue to see how Jesus is so much better. He is, as he's going to bring out in the seventh chapter, Jesus is the perfect high priest, something that they really needed to grasp and gather 
as they thought about it because of the fact that he says he is such a high priest for these reasons. Look at 726. He says, verse 25 actually, he's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Those high Old Testament high priests, they all died. Jesus died, was buried, was raised again, but he is not going to die ever again. He is eternal. And what is he doing right now? He's making intercession for you and me right now. Boy, you talk about a friend. You talk about a wonderful priest. He is there making that intercession for me. And notice going on there, verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy. He is holy unlike any of those Old Testament high priests was. Because, again, he was God in the flesh. He was harmless. He was undefiled. He was separate from sinners. And he has become higher than the heavens. He does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices on a day-by-day -day basis, first for himself and then for all the people's sins. No, he offered himself once for all. He is the perfect priest. And he ever lives to live to be there for you and I each and every day. Isn't that great? Do we really begin to grasp and understand His priesthood and what He has done for us in that respect? I don't know that we have. I don't know that we really can until we truly grasp and get into the book of Hebrews in the way that we need to. But then He not only talks about the superiority of Christ over the prophets, over the angels, He's not only talking about the superiority of Christ over Moses and His priesthood, but He also talks about the superiority of Christ's covenant. Because of the fact that Jesus could not serve as a high priest under the Old Testament law, because he was not of the tribe of Levi, he was of the tribe of Judah. And again, a great argument is there made in Hebrews, the seventh chapter of the silence of the scriptures. In the fact, he says, It is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, out of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. By virtue of the fact that Moses commanded, According to what God has said, that only the Levites were to serve as priests, Jesus could not serve as a priest under that Old Testament. So, whenever he served as a priest, that necessarily meant something else had to happen. And what was that? The Old Covenant had to be done away. And you know, most of us probably grasp that point, because we do understand that, understand that point, that the Old Law was done away. Ephesians 2, Colossians 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, on and on it goes, the book of Galatians, the entire book of Hebrews discusses this idea that because the priesthood has been changed, the law had to be changed as well. In Hebrews chapter 8, he quotes from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, word for word, and emphasized the idea that God knew that that covenant had to be changed and emphasized the fact that it was going to be changed one of these days. And Jesus' covenant is superior to that Old Testament covenant. Have you ever sat down and read through the book of Leviticus? Now let me ask you this. I want you to think about this for just a minute. As you're reading through the Bible, and you sit up on January 1st, you say, you know, I'm going to read through the Bible this year, and that's great. You know where most people are going to get sidetracked? I'll tell you right now. Most people are going to get sidetracked with Leviticus. And if they plow through Leviticus, the next time they're going to get sidetracked is around 1 Chronicles, when you start reading all the names, Right? And you're sitting there thinking to yourself, man, why do I have to go through ten chapters of names, right? Most people get sidetracked in Leviticus because they're sitting there thinking, what has this got to do with me? I don't have to do all this today. I don't have to offer these sacrifices. I don't have to watch the blood of bulls and goats. Jesus did that, so I'll just skip all that. But if you sit down and really read it, if you sit down and grasp what he's trying to bring out there, It'll cause you to fall on your knees and thank God every day for Jesus Christ and what He did for us on that cross. And you see, because of that idea of Jesus, the covenant was changed. We're now living under a new and a better covenant. A better priesthood, a better covenant. Jesus is the superiority of His sanctuary and sacrifice. Again, the earthly sanctuary was the tabernacle, the temple. And they had this, this, this place where they went to worship God. Where's Jesus? He's at the right hand of God the Father in heaven right now. So much of a better tabernacle than we could ever possibly begin to imagine. And where does He live now? In our hearts. Galatians 2 verse 20. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6. He lives within us. You think about that idea. He's not only the superiority of Christ's sanctuary, but then you think about the superiority of his sacrifice. Verse chapter 9, verse 23, It was necessary that the copy of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest did every year with blood of another, since he would have had to suffer since the foundation of the world. But he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice himself once at the end of the ages. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. So Christ offered to bear the sins of many one time, a one-time sacrifice. And we're here today rejoicing because of that fact. The superiority of the Christian's walk of faith is what he emphasizes in chapter 11, verses thir chapter 11 through the 13th chapter. Now again, we think about the hall, <clears throat> the hall of faith there, the, that hall of fame, that hall of the faithful, right? In Hebrews chapter 11. One of the things that I'm sure is going to be brought out to you later, we study that a lot of times, we teach it to our children, rightly so. But you know one of the things that always has impresses me, and I really want to make this point, is those men and women in Hebrews chapter 11 were just like us. They, they were not supermen and superwomen. They didn't have anything special about them that made them that way. They just made choices of faith. Brethren, today we could do the same thing. Just think about what could really happen today if we truly live our lives by faith. If we truly did what God wanted and what God expected of us to do each and every day of our lives, would it change our life? Would it change our world? I submit unto you, yes, it would. It most certainly would. But again, we let the world beat us down, and a lot of times we don't always live up to that. It's interesting, after he emphasizes all this roll call of the faithful in Hebrews chapter 11, he then stresses this ideal in chapter 12. Love this. And to me, it's one of those ideas that you get a lot of times, maybe they didn't divide the Bible exactly right here in this chapter. But he says, let us lay aside every weight. And the sin which does so easily ensnare us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What again is he trying to do to those brethren that he's writing to at that time? He's trying to get their faith and their focus back on Jesus Christ. That is the need of the church in the first century. That is the need of the church in the 21st century. We must keep our faith and focus on Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Do we? Do we? Or do we allow the world to sidetrack us? Well, as I said a few moments ago, and I think we need to stress this, as you look through this, he emphasizes the superiority of Christ, but he also emphasizes some warnings here. There are some warnings, very real warning. First of all, the danger of neglect. In chapter 2, and he'll, you'll see this interspersed all the way through the book. He'll, he'll make his point and he'll say, okay, here's my application. Love that about him. We must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. You see, brethren, there is a very real danger that we could drift away. Some members of the Lord's church have drifted away. It isn't because of any real big thing in their lives. They just started missing the services, maybe on Wednesday night. And then after a period of time, it was a Sunday night service. And then nobody really said anything to them about it and encouraged them and trying to encourage them to come back. So then what began to happen is they started maybe missing Bible class on Sunday morning. Oh, they'd be there on Sunday morning to take the Lord's Supper and do the worship, but, you know, well, I don't really see the need for Bible class, and, and I don't know why we've got to meet two, day, or two times on Sunday, and, and I don't see the need for extra Bible study. And what's happening? They're not going away, just turning their back on Christ. They're just drifting, just drifting. And eventually what winds up happening is they get so far away that they lose their moorings, and they can't come back, or they won't come back. There's the danger of unbelief. Again, he uses the example of the Old Testament Jews, how they had come to the point, and think about number in the book of Numbers, how they had just about got to the point of entering the land of promise. 
a land that they had been dreaming about all their years for 400 something years while in Egyptian bondage. They dreamed of the land where God was going to give them one day, a land that He had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can you think about waiting for something all that time? And then Moses comes and he, he brings them and delivers them from the land of Egypt. Of course, we remember it's God doing all of that. And again, God continually refers to this all through the prophets. He said, one of the things you have to remember is I'm the one who delivered you. I redeemed you. I made you a special people because I chose you. You're special not because you are righteous, but because I chose you. And they get to the very edge. And you remember the story in Numbers 13 and 14. They send out the spies. Two spies came back with a good report. We all remember their names, don't we? But how many of us can remember the name of the ten spies? And the ten spies convinced everybody else, we can't do this. And God says, enough's enough. This generation shall not enter into the rest that I was planning to give them. As you read this in Hebrews, the third chapter, he emphasizes the idea it was because of their unbelief, because they didn't believe God could do what he promised he was going to do. And again, before I pick up a stone and throw at him, how often does that happen in my life? And how often does that happen in your life? You read these great, precious promises in God's Word, but you sit back in the back of your mind and say, well, you know, I just can't believe. And the moment you say that, you're on the road of unbelief. You, you see how it's so applicable to us today? And then, believe it or not, there's the danger of immaturity. The danger of immaturity. I like this. I found this today as I was doing this. You know, you have a couple of guys here. One guy's trying to work on this, this vacuum cleaner. You can't see it that well, can you? This guy's trying to work on the vacuum cleaner. This other guy's around here keeping it unplugged. You know? He can't figure out what's causing it. It says immaturity. Some people never grow up. And I can't help but say amen. That is so true in the church. And it ought not to be the case. The Hebrew writer, and again, most of us could probably remember this. He says, though by the time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. The first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. There is the challenge of immaturity in the church. And that is a challenge that elders and deacons think about all the time. And a lot of times I think I've seen a lot of good elders and a lot of deacons as well and preachers sit down and blame themselves maybe because of the immaturity of some members. But you know, it gets back down to the fact, you know, you train your children up to do a certain thing a certain while, but if, you know, they make those bad decisions, what? It's not your fault anymore. It's theirs. Then there was the danger of drawing back. In chapter 10, they, they were started off good, but what happened? Well, they kept drawing back. They kept getting back. They kept getting further and further back. And that's why you find if we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice of sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He talks about of how much sore punishment do you suppose shall he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Count of the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and salt of the Spirit of grace. Again, they were drawing back. They weren't living lives of faith. They weren't getting it. And you know, sometimes elders can see this, preachers can see this. One time, maybe a member of the church is actively involved, doing whatever needs to be done. You call them, they're there. And then what begins to happen, maybe they get a little bit older and they've got too much on their plate, their schedule is getting too tough, and then after a period of time they just keep backing up a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further, kind of like the drifters. And then before long you can't get them to do anything except, and please forgive me if I'm talking about you, but understand that I'm saying it in love, all they seem like they ever do then is just warm up you. And sometimes they don't always do that. And then there's the danger of refusing God and His promises. Refusing the chastening that God gives us. And refusing Him who speaks. Again, how do we build our faith? Faith comes by, come on, hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. My voice is about gone, so it's time for y'all to talk. 
hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? You see, brethren, so we need to keep listening. Now, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes we have a listening problem. Maybe some of us need some hearing aids. You know what I'm trying to say, and I'm saying that in a great deal of love. Some of us need to start listening to what God is saying. Instead of sitting back saying, I've got it all figured out. There is that danger of refusing to listen. You know, whenever my dad, my dad was a Marine Corps sergeant. He was a gunny sergeant. He was in the Marine Corps for 17 years. When my dad spoke, I guarantee you, I listened. Forget that E.F. Hutton guy. I listened. I mean, because he, he, he made his point. That's the way we all feel like whenever God speaks. When God speaks, yes, Lord, your servant hears. What do you want me to do? And then do it. How can we do it, brethren? How can we stay faithful? Again, let's go to the 10th chapter, verses 19 through 29, or 39. How can we stay faithful to the Lord? And how can we encourage others to do the same? As you go through this book, another one of the things you'll see over and over again is what I call the lettuce passages. Over and over again, he uses this phrase, let us, let us, let us, let us, let us. And most of them are found in the 10th chapter, beginning of verse 19. How can I stay faithful? How can I encourage others to stay faithful? What do I need to do in this respect? What can I do to encourage that? Number one, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. First thing we need to do, maybe if you're getting to the point where you're, you're wondering about your relationship with God, get closer to God. Draw near to Him. Do it boldly. We have the opportunity to do that through this new and living way. Not like the old way of the Old Testament, but under this new and living way through the blood of Jesus. He's given us that opportunity. We have a new high priest, and we need to draw with a true heart, a pure heart, in full assurance of faith. We need to believe God. And you see, we need to just get closer. And again, how many times have you heard preachers say, or maybe you've seen it, you know, if you don't feel as close to God as you once did... Guess who moved? It's not God, it's you. And you see, we are encouraged because, again, of Jesus Christ to come near, and not just to come near, but to come before God boldly, with confidence. I think a lot of us sit down and think about our past sins, and we're not all that confident about our relationship with God, are we? Well, you see, do we believe? It kind of goes back to that idea. Do we believe that God's forgiven us of our sins? Well, Tommy, you don't know the sins I've committed. Doesn't matter. Jesus said His blood take care of everything. Doesn't matter. Well, Tommy, you, it doesn't matter. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he thought about his life. He remembered his life before he became a Christian. He said, I'm the chiefest of sinners, but he also says this. He said, if God is able to save me, He's going to be able to save anybody else. And you see what God did through Paul because of his full assurance, because of his drawing boldly before the Father all the time? Yes, brethren, it is easy. I've done it. I think all of us do from time to time. We beat ourselves up because of our sins. But we can draw near to God boldly because we have been redeemed and saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Secondly, verses 23 through 25, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he promised his faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, he emphasizes, first of all, draw near. Secondly, hold fast. Hold fast. Sometimes, brethren, don't we, we can't do a lot of great things, but sometimes the best thing we can do is just hold on. I used to have a little thing in my <clears throat> office that said, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. That's it. With Jesus Christ, we can hang on, hold fast to that confession without wavering. Why? Because He who promised is faithful. People aren't always faithful, amen? God is. Do we believe that? Oh, well, that kind of goes back to this belief thing again, right? So there it is, right? And as a result of that, we need to hold fast. 
And as we're holding fast, we're thinking not just about ourselves. We're dying to ourselves, but we're considering one another. We're stirring one another up. We're not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And again, in this immediate context, my opinion is, as he's talking about the day approaching, that again, if this was written right before the destruction of Jerusalem, that they could have possibly seen the Roman armies beginning to surround the city. And that's when they needed that much more encouragement to hang in there whenever things were going to get tough. How does it apply to us? We don't know when the day's going to approach, do we? We don't know when the Lord's going to come again, but until He does, we have to hold fast. Number three, consider God's judgment. That ought to wake us up to realize some things as well. Chapter 20, 10, verse 26 to 31. Realize the fact that God is God that will judge the world one of these days. Acts 17, 20, <clears throat> Acts 17, 29 through 31. He will come again. He promised that. Well, Lord, uh, and Tommy, he hadn't come in the last 2,010 years. I mean, you know, what do you, well, doesn't matter. God's timetable is not my timetable. If you were to die right now, do you know nothing doubting that you'd go to heaven? If not, you need to get things straight. You need to be remembering, always remembering. Remember the former days. Remember what you endured. And sometimes I think the thing that we need to do with some of our unfaithful members is to do what he's telling them to do here. What motivated you to become a Christian to begin with? Do you remember... How you felt when you knew your sins were forgiven when you were baptized into Christ. Remember, and that's what he's challenging them to do. Recall the former days when you were eliminated. You endured a great struggle with suffering. Partly by you were made a spectacle by, by the reproaches and tribulations. Partly become you come, because you became companions of those who were so treated. And you had compassion on me and my chains. Sometimes, brethren, we just need to remember. And maybe we need to stop for a few moments and encourage those brothers and sisters to remember. And then remember the reward. Do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. You have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And what's the promise? Yet a little while, he who is coming will come and will not tarry. And until then, the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So what's he saying? I think he's emphasizing the idea that if you draw back, you'll miss out. But we need to have the endurance, the patience to hang in there to the very end, considering all the time the reward. It amazes me that as you look in the book of First Peter, or Second Peter, when Peter's talking about the Lord's return, he says this, that we need to look for and hasten the return of the Lord. Brethren, how many of us are looking forward to the Lord's coming again? Some of us are. Some of us are getting kind of tired now. We're ready to go home. We're ready for that rest that that remains for the people of God, Hebrews chapter 4. I hope you can say you're ready. We'll talk about this in just a minute.
announcements before Brother Tommy comes back and extends your invitation. Concerning those on our prayer list, Joan Thurman remains at Higgins. She had some complications from her surgery. She was doing some better yesterday versus the day before, so we're hopeful that she will continue to improve. Cindy Spake is now home after some recent surgery, and she's doing okay. Brother Ray Spake is in the hospital in Bremen at Higgins. He's in room 252. You're also asked to remember others that have been on our sick and prayer list. The mission trip to Panama is upcoming. For those who wish to help with the costs of that, if you would like to do so, please make your check payable to the Bremen Church of Christ. And in the memo line, indicate Panama mission trip. There will be approximately $1,000 per head that is necessary to go to this. Of course, those that are going are trying to raise as much as they can personally. But for those who wish to help in that effort, any, even the smallest donation would be greatly appreciated. Our summer quarter begins this Sunday. We'll have a potluck after the evening service. Brothers Keepers Groups 1 and 2 are asked to be responsible for this event. Camp and Nagahi registration forms are in the foyer for those who wish to take advantage of that. Bremen's week is June the 20th. Tommy's week comes up this coming Sunday. So camp begins in earnest this Sunday. But Bremen's week, again, is June 20th. You can also register online if you wish to do that, and you can pay online at campinagahi.org. There will be a staff and counselor meeting for those who are participating at camp. Camp and Gay staff and counselor meeting Tuesday, June the 15th, here at the building at 7 p.m. So if you are a staff member or a counselor for camp upcoming Tuesday, June 15th, there will be a planning meeting here at the building, 7 p.m. This coming Sunday also, we will be honoring our graduates from high school and college. You're asked to sit down front here with your family uh, for the Sunday morning service at that time. Brother Tom. The Hebrew writers stress the idea that those people in the first or in <clears throat> Moses' day was not able to enter into the land of Canaan because of their unbelief. It was their decision. God didn't force them not to believe. He had talked about it. He had emphasized that. Whenever he delivered them from the land of Egypt and then prepared their hearts in that one year at Mount Sinai, he had prepared them for able to go into the land of Canaan. But they got to the very edge and didn't make it. And as you read the Hebrews, the fourth chapter, he says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. He goes on and emphasizes the idea. Today, verse 7, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There therefore remains a rest for the people of God. And he who has entered this rest has himself ceased from his works as God did from his. So, in another one of those let us passages, let us be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. The Hebrew writer makes it clear that we could get to the very point and miss out. We have to be diligent. We have to work and make sure we do what we need to do so that we might be able to enter that rest as well. You know, I've lived as a Christian since I was 13 years old. And I keep thinking about sometimes it would be easier just to kind of back off, you know, to, to maybe not work so hard, maybe, maybe just kind of do like others, you know, just, just go out and get me a job somewhere else, stop preaching, and just, just, just kind of sit back and, and, and sit there and, and watch everything. But you know what? I don't want to get that, to that point. I'm not saying that those who just sit are not going to make it to heaven. Don't misunderstand me. I don't know your heart, no matter, and you don't know mine. But I think about it in my own life that God has given me some small, and I do mean this, small gift, and I have to make sure that I'm using that gift to the very time that I draw my last breath. Do you feel that same way? Do you have that kind of same kind of attitude? Do you, do you want to get to heaven that bad? 
Do you, do you want to continue to be diligent to enter that rest? I hope so. Because so many, and you know what I'm talking about, is what I was talking about at the very beginning. So many of our brothers and sisters have lost sight of this. They've quit trying. They're not diligent anymore. They've drifted away. They've become neglectful. They've allowed other things or other people to keep them from doing what God wants and what God expects of them to do. Please, please, don't be one of them. Be diligent. If you're not ready to meet the Lord right now, then I want to encourage you to come as we sing. If you're not a child of God, here's your opportunity to do it. In faith, repent of your sins, confess His name, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And brethren, should we not meet again, I hope to see you in heaven. If you need to come and make things right, so you'll get there. Do it while we stand and sing. fine lesson. I told him just a minute ago, I'm worn out. I know he is. That was quite a whirlwind trip, but we're so thankful for his efforts tonight. Turn with me to number 18 for our closing song. Number 18. We'll sing one verse of that and have our closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come here tonight and for all of us to gather together and worship you and learn more about you. We ask that you be with us as we leave here tonight to help us to be strong examples that you would want us to be to our friends and our family and to our co-workers, those that are around us. We also ask that you forgive us of our sins and help us to stay strong and not commit the sins 
that you don't that you would not want us to do. Please just be with us and keep us safe. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.